The Trinity? Yeah. Yes. And tell me how hard you was. What did you do? Well, one of the things we did is we installed our equipment with another engineer by the name of Marlow, and I can't remember what his what his what the first or last name is. And hooked and hooked it up to other people's lines or equipment lines, I should say, rather than equipment. And then, of course, uh, we went through the dry runs, and it was not, it's not unusual for you to do ten or twelve dry runs with each with each customer until he's happy and you're happy. How many customers did you have? Do you think? <laughs> I don't. I don't remember. A couple hundred. A lot of them. No, I don't think it was a couple of hundred. I think probably something in the order of thirty or forty. We got up around six o'clock in the morning, had our breakfast, and then went out in the field to work. And some mornings we got up earlier than that because in the middle of July it's pretty hot on the desert. Early in the morning it's like thirty some odd degrees, but by the time four o'clock rolls around it's a hundred and some odd degrees. It was really nice and clean work as far as uh, our group was concerned because we had all these boxes made and already wired internally and whatnot. And all we had to do is help people hook up to our equipment and then run some tests. Well, we were ready, but we, our readiness had to be in conjunction with some of our customers. And we had to know from the charts that Joe McKibben made, this customer goes on at such and such a time, comes off at such and such a time, is repeated so many times. And if they all if they all came out fine, why it was great. But you didn't find it worked that way. There were a lot of a lot of times you had to go back and improve. Oh, you betcha we did. I was standing in front of a relay rack, and my instructions were at such and such a time: plug in so and so, shut off so and so, throw the power switches. Uh, monitor this and that and the other thing. And I think, I don't remember to tell you the truth, how long the countdown lasted, whether it was 15 minutes or a half an hour. I remember that they started the countdown. I think, let me change that. I think we detonated at 5.30, I think. Yeah, and... Uh, the, the night before, while it was raining, waiting for 5.30 to come around, everybody was well ready by that time, but before that, why it was not havoc, but uh, after dinner, you, after your lunch or whatever it was, you went back out in the field and it did some more work. No, well, I think by this, well, our, our equipment was especially taken, well taken care of because we had Joe McKibben as guidance. Yeah, it was a bell went off at each second and there was a drum that turned, I think one revolution each second. Um, no, but what? the countdown started much earlier than that. I think he's wrong when he when he said that. Yeah. Uh, the the drum took forty five seconds. Took the drum took one second to make a complete revolution, and it did, and it worked for forty five seconds as I remember it. And. Listen, we, we had uh, situations where several hours before the event really took place where they would take attendance and whatnot and to make sure everybody was on station to do, their, to do their thing, so to speak. And all of that, I think, is part of the countdown. When he says the real countdown, I wonder what he means by that. Oh, well, that's possibility, sure, sure. Yeah, once the, before the automatic timer turned on, you could shut it off and start all over again. We could even shut it off while the automatic timer was run, running, too.
Well, let me say it another way. I, I can't remember all the types of experiments that were performed, but there, there were a lot of them. And I, I feel uh, insecure about talking about this only in the sense that since I wasn't hardly involved in that kind of an operation, I hate like hell to give you an answer. Yeah. But there was something about drum rotating once every second and 45 seconds were required. And I can't say I rem can remember anything more than that. Okay. Well, I, you know, I'm a little bit influenced with my past experience to answer that question. Trinity taught me a lot of things. Number one, that you can't be too careful. And number two, you gotta be really thorough in, in, your, in your work. And then the bomb didn't go off on top of a tower and you know who went up to get it. <laughs> and then another bomb prematured on me and I saved the lives of three guys when I refused to do what my management want me to do. That all, all that has an effect on your thinking, you know. Yeah. It hasn't got a damn thing to do with Trinity, but... Uh, somebody said that the person who said this was, uh, it was an awe-inspiring event, that somebody said that Bradbury said that. I claim I said it, but he's, he was a director. And <laughs> yeah. I'm a peon. I don't think so. It's true those two bombs helped end the war in a hurry. My opinion is when MacArthur wanted to use one in Korea, we, he should have given it to him and let him, let him use it. But that's not a sociable conversation with anybody. That's uh, insubordination. As I said earlier, I think the uh, Trinity people were very dedicated to their, to their tasks and did a wonderful and thorough job. Well, you know, things got pretty loose after the, after the shots went off successfully and uh, I felt, I'd felt I did a great job, but on the other hand, I had a wife coming to Albuquerque and I thought, you see, being with her was more important. So I, I was completely satisfied with our, with our performance. And then, of course, you get a nice letter from the higher-ups of Los Alamos, which was known as the Post Office Box 1663. It's uh, complimentary, and of course it's complimentary because the operation was a success. Well, it makes sense only in the dry run operation, you see. I'm honestly lost. I don't know how to answer that. And I guess neither do you. That's why we're fishing for it. But I think old Joe McKibben, are you going to go see him again? Timing is a phenomenon, you see, is one of what bothers me in the sense that if a signal is supplied to zero at zero time, that signal is going to get way down below us so many milliseconds or microseconds added to the time it took to get to the first location. And I'm not sure anybody who was there can answer that the question the way you're asking it. McKibben was uh, appointed in so far as being in charge of design and operation of the timing systems. No, I don't think it's the word is synchronization. Well, synchronization with his, within his own group and with his own equipment, yes. But when we go outside the, that group, we have a different kind of situation. Well, we didn't have any specified number, so to speak. Nor did we have a specified interval of time to complete our work. 
I can tell you about timing of some of the relays we had, supplying signals at the right time to the users. We had we were requested to advise them how long to stay on the air and when to get off the air. I don't know if advising is a is a good word. I'm stuck. I can't I can't help you on that okay. at the moment. Oh no, not not that hect hectic at all. And a lot of this equipment was autom automotive was automated, in the sense that. Did you read all about the relays and all that good stuff? Mm -hmm. 34 steps, change polarity each step to make them advance one notch. Okay, one of the, one of the things that, one of the characteristics of the four master relays that we had in the overall timing situation involved relays that would step 34 different steps, each step there was, a, I think, a five millivolt or five milliampere current through the, through the line, and each step, the polarity would be reversed. And you went through that for 34 steps. There's some signals, if you will, to a customer. And you multiply that by four, we got uh, 140, some odd now, I think. Uh, the man in charge of timing, timing of events, timing of happening of happenings. Keep pushing. No, I don't think we had cared when people ate. We had a job in the field to uh, incorporate various relays, timers, and that type of equipment so that the users would have the capability of, pro of being provided with a signal at the right time. Well, the users were customers. <laughs> That's a vague answer. <laughs> and a customer is an example of uh, your friend here knows a man who he, whom I worked with over the years. He was, he's involved with the camera and crossroads and things like this. He was a customer and we would turn his camera on at so many milliseconds or microseconds or seconds after a certain time and let it run for so long and then shut it off. Then we go to the next customer. What were we capturing? We were capturing something we were asked to do. I'm sorry to be so vague, but uh, what were the signals? Well, there were voltage signals and there were timing signals. Yeah, they activated some type of mechanism, namely a meter or something like that. Well, number one, he would tell us pretty straightforwardly if we didn't do what he wanted. And the second thing I would say is they were very thankful when everything worked properly. I say the proper timing gave us a great big output from a bomb that otherwise could be a, a, a bummer. I had a picture at one time uh, of uh, the uh, power power generator for uh, South 10,000, a place where all the wires came up from the ground and went over, over the terrain. And I have a picture, I had a, this picture of showing all these wires and whatnot. When you retire, you throw all that stuff away. Well, that's an interesting question that goes way back, though, in, in this sense that when I first arrived at Los Alamos, nobody told me what was going on, and we had a daily quiz to see if I could pass all the college exams. 
And having satisfied that, they decided, you, we better tell Schreiber what's, what's really going on here. And that's how I learned about detonations and Trinity and all that good stuff. No, we didn't have the thought so much. Of, we thought more about the thought of this thing might kill us all. It might expand much greater than we had calculated to, to, to the output. You wait on the chow line, there was a lot, of, a lot of dignitaries and mixed in with the SEDs and things like this, and that's how, how that got started. Yeah. And of course, the theoretical physicists are the people who prompted the story. We might all go to the end. Joe McKibben told me not to worry that it would be okay. <laughs>